Welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and change makers who are working on solutions that face our fellow individual community members, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This is George Coster, your host. Welcome to our 2022 election show. Given all the propositions on both the state of California level, as well as the usual too many propositions to understand on the city of San Francisco level, we wanted to bring together two wonderful subject matter experts to help us better understand both the pros and cons of both state and city propositions. We're joined remotely by Michelle Moritz, the Speaker's Bureau Chair of the League of Women's Voters of San Francisco, and Madison Alvarado, a reporter and the co-creator of the San Francisco Public Press Election Guide. Welcome to Voices of the Community, Madison and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. So, Madison, please share with the audience a little background on the San Francisco Public Press. Yeah. So, the San Francisco Public Press is a nonprofit, non commercial news organization, and we publish independent public interest journalism about undercover topics with a focus on really uh, reaching out and listening to issues affecting underserved audiences. We began in 2009 as an experiment to provide nonprofit local news with a more investigative focus that we felt like was kind of missing in the Bay Area. You can read our work online. We also have a radio station, which I have right here at 102.5 FM, or you can check out our flagship podcast, Civic, on any platform where you get your podcasts. So yeah. We really wanted to start with a macro level with the state propositions. And let's turn to Michelle to kind of walk us through the seven propositions at the state level. Okay. First, I just wanted to say a tiny bit about the League of Women Voters. We're a nonpartisan political nonprofit that defends democracy. We provide education to encourage people to vote and participate in government. We do engage in some advocacy to influence public policy that benefits the community. And one important thing to note, and the way I will speak today, is that we don't support or oppose any candidates or political parties. And also, despite our name, which is historic, people of all genders are welcome. So I'll delve into the California props now, starting with Prop 1, which is the constitutional right to reproductive freedom. And the question here is, shall the California Constitution expressly provide that the state of California shall not deny or interfere with an individual's reproductive freedom in their most intimate decisions, including the right to choose to have an abortion and their right to choose or refuse contraception? So this one would be actually changing the constitution of the state to specify that this constitutional amendment is intended to further the right of privacy and the right to not be denied equal protection. So some of the supporters say that Prop 1 will enshrine the fundamental right to an abortion and contraception in the California state constitution. And yes on Prop 1 is necessary to keep reproductive medical decisions where they belong with individuals and their healthcare providers based on scientific facts, not political arguments. And the opponents say that our current California law already grants these rights to abortion and contraception. And the recent US Supreme Court ruling that prompted putting this on the ballot did not and will not change this. Prop 1 is not needed to protect women's health or their reproductive rights. The opponents also argue that Prop 1 is an extreme and costly proposal that allows unrestricted late-term abortions and punishes taxpayers. Abortion seekers from outside California will swamp California's resources. I heard uh, some interviews around how this on Prop 1 and one thing I thought was an interesting fact is that that there is only about 1% of abortions that occur after the second trimester now. And those are by and large due to serious medical issues with either the fetus or the pregnant woman. So moving on to props 26 and 27, I guess I would describe those together because they're both they both involve expanding gambling in California. So Prop 26 would expand gambling 
on in Indian owned casinos and at four horse racing tracks around the state. And it would, the question is whether California should expand the allowable gambling activities at American Indian owned casinos and these four horse racing tracks, including betting on sports events for those 21 years or older. So it would also allow tribal casinos to run new roulette and dice games. It would allow the casinos and four horse race tracks to offer on-site betting on sports events like football games, although no betting would be allowed on California high school or college sports. It would impose a 10% tax on sports betting at racetracks and the tracks revenue left after deduct deducting the costs of sports betting regulation would be divided to send 70% to the state general fund, 15% to programs on gaming and mental health research, and 15% to the Department of Justice for enforcing gaming laws. And Prop 26 and 27 both legalize sports betting in some way. So if both pass, they both may take effect. And since some provisions in these two props may conflict, those would most likely have to be resolved in court. Okay, so for 26, the supporters say that it would continue the 20 year legacy of allowing closely regulated gaming to support American Indian economies. And Prop 26 is the most responsible approach to authorizing sports wagering and would promote American Indian self-reliance. The opponents say Prop 26 would massively expand gambling in California for the benefit of the large tribal casinos. So this one would leave out some of the smaller tribes that don't have these large casinos. Prop 26 would also leave casino workers unprotected from worker safety, harassment, and discrimination. It also does not require minimum wage salaries or health insurance for casino workers. Then moving on to Prop 27, this one would allow online and mobile sports wagering outside of tribal lands from anywhere. So from your mobile device or computer, in your bedroom, wherever you wanna engage in this type of gambling. And of course it would be restricted to people 21 years of age or older. So it would allow betting on adult sports events online from anywhere. It allows tribes to offer online sports betting under the tribe's branding for a one-time $10 million state licensing fee, followed by a renewal fee every five years. But it would also allow gaming companies that are not affiliated with casinos to strike a deal with a tribe to operate in California. They would have to pay a one-time licensing fee of $100 million plus a renewal fee every five years. It would require the creation of a new sports wagering regulatory division within the state's Justice Department, and it would impose a 10% tax on all companies or tribes offering sports betting. After the regulatory costs, 85% of revenue from taxes and fees would support mental health programs and help the homeless. 15% would go to Indian tribes that are not involved in sports betting. So this one would include some money for the smaller tribes that don't have large casinos, unlike Prop 26. None of the revenue or licensing fees would be included in the state's general fund for purposes of allocating money to programs such as public education. So the supporters of Prop 27 say that this will provide hundreds of millions of dollars to support programs that alleviate homelessness and study mental health and addiction in California. Prop 27 will benefit every California tribe, especially the rural and economically disadvantaged tribes that don't own big casinos and have been kind of left out of the profits generated by gambling. The opponents say Prop 27 is a deceptive measure promoted by out-of-state companies to legalize online and mobile sports gambling in California. Online gambling is not a solution to homelessness or other social ills and will promote more gambling addictions. 
So before we start, I would love to get each of your take on who you think is behind both propositions, because they've spent massive amounts of money on TV to convince folks for each of their propositions. So, you know, Michelle, do you want to provide a little context of, from your perspective, who are the folks that brought these two propositions onto the ballot? So I understand that Prop 27 is the, you know, big backers of that are these large companies that provide online sports wagering. Perhaps Madison knows more details than I do about this. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to jump in. I I believe, especially for Prop 27, some of the main supporters are these large sports betting companies like FanDuel, DraftKings, BetMGM, and a few other large gaming companies that would stand to make quite a bit of money if these if this measure passes. Something else I remember reading about, I believe it was Cal Matters article, sort of discussing how the cost to entry, the entry level fees for a lot of the gaming companies that would be able to provide online sports betting under Prop 27. There are very high requirements for how much these companies have to pay and also requirements in terms of how how many states they're operating in and things like that, that the consensus among some folks over at Cal Matters seemed to be that it was the way that the measure was written, it was going to be really hard for smaller companies looking to offer online sports betting. It was going to be really hard for them to meet the thresholds required under Prop 27. And it was going to largely be a few of these companies like FanDuel and DraftKings who are going to be able to benefit just because I think they have to be operating in a certain number of states. And obviously, the $100 million licensing fee is pretty steep as well. So George, you touched on this a bit. I mean, we all, I think, are aware that this has been both measures, 26 and 27, there's been hundreds of millions of dollars poured into funding those campaigns. And I know I've been getting bombarded with ads for both sides for and against. And one of the big ads that I've been seeing a lot of for Prop 27 was saying it was really being supported by tribes. But when you look at the numbers, I believe Prop 27 is supported by three Native American tribes, but opposed by 50 Native American tribes. And then for 26, which is uh the other competing measure, I believe there are 27 tribes supporting it. So I think looking at those number breakdowns, it is kind of interesting seeing, you know, what the ads are saying versus looking into the numbers of who actually is supporting those measures and sort of how that that pans out. So, yeah. That's great. I make another comment about that too. It reminded me that I also noticed in the, in some of the information that organizations to help the homeless and veterans groups are kind of split on whether they support Prop 27 or not. You know, it's supposed to raise all this money to support the homeless and mental health and gambling addiction problems. And uh, but it, I thought it was interesting that the people who would the organizations that would benefit from funding raised by 27 are pretty much split on whether they think it's a good idea or not. Great. Thank you. And Michelle, do you want to move on to the next proposition? Sure. So moving on to Prop 28, this would provide additional funding for arts and music education in California public schools. So we already do because of Prop 98, which was passed in 1988. We already do have money that is devoted to supporting arts and music education in public schools, but this would simply increase that amount and, and add a few additional specifics. So to get into those, the question is, shall the state provide specific funding for arts and music education in public schools at a higher level than the existing constitutional minimum required for public education. So it would require the state to set aside an additional portion of the general fund for arts and music education in K-12 schools and at greater than or equal to 1% of the funding received by schools in the prior year as designated by Prop 98 will supplement the amount currently provided. And to, to address equity issues, Prop 28 would allocate more money to schools that serve many low-income students. Schools would must now report how the funding is used 
and larger schools would be required to spend 80% of the funding to employ new staff and 20% on training and supplies. And the supporters say arts and music education can improve a student's personal and academic life. Only one in five schools have a dedicated teacher for arts and music programs, so this prop would assist with that deficit, and it does not raise taxes. As far as I know right now, there is no organized campaign to oppose this proposition. Thank you. That was really also a great insight. Shall we move to the next proposition, Michelle? Sure. Okay, Prop 29 may give you deja vu because we've already <laughs> voted on this twice in recent years and it was voted down each time. So this would require on-site licensed medical professionals at kidney dialysis clinics and establishes other state requirements. So this prop would require outpatient dialysis clinics to have a physician nurse practitioner or physician assistant with at least six months of kidney care experience on site at all hours when patients are being treated. The clinics would also have to, to report to patients the name of any physician with greater than or equal to 5% interest in the clinic. And clinics would not be able to discriminate among patients based on the source of payment. Clinics would also have to report information about dialysis-related infections among their patients to the state, and clinics would have to obtain permission from the state to close or reduce hours. So the supporters say that requiring a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician, or physician assistant to pre be present during a dangerous procedure like dialysis is common sense and a matter of safety for patients. Dialysis clinics currently face fewer inspections than other health facilities, and deficiencies are often uncovered. The supporters also say the big corporations operating dialysis clinics can easily make the required staffing changes and still profit hundreds of millions of dollars a year. The opponents say the clinics already use specially trained technicians and every patient is already under the care of their own kidney doctor, so more oversight is unnecessary. Prop 29 would also take thousands of skilled medical staff from hospitals where they're needed and place them in administrative jobs in these clinics. And on-site administrators who do not provide patient care would cost hundreds of millions of dollars every year, forcing clinics to reduce hours or close. And Madison, any thoughts on dialysis re revisited? I feel like it's to your to to Michelle's point, it's deja vu all over again. Yeah, I, I believe this is the third time that a dialysis related measure has been on the ballot. I think just in response to the discussion of clinics being forced to close, state analysts estimate that clinics have a total revenue of about $3.5 billion a year and that two private for-profit companies are operating about 75% of the clinic. So I just think that's some in, you know background to add on to some of those points. Good context. And Michelle, would you like to provide the, the next proposition? Sure. I had one more thing to say about Prop 29. Let's I tried do. to I tried to look into why this keeps appearing on the ballot, and my best guess is that clinic workers would like to unionize, and they have not. They have been unsuccessful in bringing that about, and so unions are unfortunately I can't remember which one or more it is, but there. This is a way to put pressure on who runs these clinics to agitate for the unionization of the workers at the clinics. That's my my best understanding of, of why this keeps coming up. Thank you. I think wasn't the, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether it was two generations ago, wasn't there a part of it that was there, they were trying to unionize and union vote and then the employers made sure that, that the union vote basically lost? That was what I, what I I learned trying to look into the background of this. Yeah, and I looked it up. It looks like the union is the Service Employees International Union, United Healthcare Workers West. Okay, and then Michelle, shall we go to Proposition 30, Income yeah. Tax on Millionaires, everybody's favorite topic? 
<laughs> yeah, so Prop 30 would provide funding for programs to reduce air pollution and prevent wildfires by increasing tax on personal income over $2 million. So question is whether the tax rate on people who earn more than $2 million a year be increased by 1.75% to support zero emission vehicle subsidies and infrastructure such as charging stations and wildfire suppression and prevention programs. So the funds would be allocated as follows. 45% would promote the purchase of zero emission vehicles or ZEVs, including subsidies and rebates for cars, trucks, and buses. 35% of the funds would increase ZEV infrastructure, including charging stations close to where people live. And 20% would help fund wildfire suppression and prevention. So the supporters say existing programs are insufficient to address California's poor air quality, which is largely caused by automobile exhaust and wildfire smoke. And Prop 30 would make electric vehicles more affordable and create well-paying green jobs. It would also fund critically needed programs to prevent catastrophic wildfires and protect homes. And there would be strict accountability to ensure that the, the funds are spent as intended. The opponents say California is already spending more than $50 billion a year for a multi-year climate investment, including $10 billion for ZEV support. There's no guarantee that Prop 30 will make ZEVs affordable for most California families. And Prop 30 would also lock money from income taxes in this special interest. And this income taxes are normally a major source of school funding and it would be locking it into the special interest. And then as you know, we've all seen Governor Newsom's ad where the claim is made that it's Lyft's attempt to get taxpayers to help foot the bill for the requirement to increase the number of electric vehicles used by Lyft's drivers. And I guess Lyft is the largest supporter of Prop 30. And Madison, in any context on your end? I think that Michelle mostly covered it, I guess, just going into a bit more detail. I believe there's a state law that by 2035, um, there will be a ban on the new sale of gas powered cars. And in that law, there's also built in rules that require a big ride share companies like Lyft and Uber that by 2030, 90% of the miles logged by drivers for those companies need to be electric vehicle cars. And so I think that's part of the thought around, you know, is this why Lyft is promoting this prop so much? Great. And then moving on to our last proposition 31. Yeah, so this is a referendum on a 2020 law that the state legislature passed that would prohibit the retail sale of certain flavored tobacco products. So there was a law, SB 793, that was enacted by the California State Legislature to ban the sale of certain flavored tobacco products. And it did not go into effect because a petition to demand a referendum on the law qualified for the ballot. And so Prop 31 would provide that in-person stores and vending machines could not sell most flavored tobacco products and tobacco product flavor enhancers, including menthol cigarettes. There would be a $250 penalty per violation for store and vending machine owners. And this would exclude premium cigars or hookah tobacco. So the supporters say Prop 31 will help decrease smoking rates, especially among youth. Prop 31 protects youth by ending the sale of candy-flavored tobacco products that lures them into lifelong addiction to nicotine. And this prop would also prevent big tobacco from causing more harm to Black communities that buy menthol-flavored tobaccos. The opponents say Prop 31 is simply prohibition of tobacco sales to adults. It will drive more tobacco sales into the existing illegal market, and it goes too far in banning some products that the FDA allows, which will cause people to buy other tobacco products that are more harmful. And who's behind this one? I think the uh, big tobacco companies and Juul, the different vaping companies, are opposed. 
Right. Madison, any insights on Prop 31? I guess just a little context. There are certain cities and counties across California that have already banned the sale of certain flavored tobacco products. I think San Francisco is one of those. So just even if this statewide ban is overturned by the proposition, those local bans will still be in place in certain cities and counties that have taken action already. So just a little nugget of info for listeners who might be in a place where that sale is already banned. Right. Like San Francisco. You're listening to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. Voices of the Community is supported by a grant from the James Irvine Foundation, dedicated to a California where all low-income workers have the power to advance economically. More at irvine.org. This is George Coster, your host, and if you're just joining us, this is our 2022 election show exploring the pros and cons of both the state of California and the city of San Francisco propositions with our guest Madison Alvarado, a reporter and the co-creator of the San Francisco Public Press Election Guide, and Michelle Moritz, the Speaker's Bureau Chair of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. We just finished with the state of California propositions, and now we're going to dive into the 14 propositions facing the city of San Francisco voters. So we're going to turn to you, Madison, to kick us off with one of 14. C is actually separate, D and E, but C also relates to housing. So Proposition C would create oversight commission to oversee one of San Francisco's largest departments, and that is the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. The Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, or HSH, is the city, the eighth largest city department, and in fiscal year 2022, through 2023, it has a budget of 672 million. So that makes it right now the largest city agency without an oversight committee. And so Proposition C would create an oversight commission to have binding authority over projects and funding for the department. And that would make it the first oversight committee in the Bay Area that is tackling projects sort of around homelessness. A lot of other cities have commissions and committees that advise their homelessness departments, but these public bodies aren't able to hold city agencies or service providers accountable. And here in San Francisco, people know that a large portion of homeless services come from third-party providers like nonprofits. And in the last few months, there have been several big investigations. I know I'm thinking of the San Francisco Chronicle investigating conditions in single room occupancy hotels. Also here at the public press, the Board of Supervisors unanimously voted to put this measure on the ballot. So clearly it has a lot of support. If this commission is created, it will have seven members and initial appointments will be made in March of 2023. Four of those appointees will be appointed by the mayor and the other three will be appointed by the Board of Supervisors. And basically, if the Oversight Commission is created, they will formulate, evaluate and set homeless policies, serve as a public forum to raise accountability issues and negate for fair policies, conduct investigations into governmental operations that are within its jurisdiction and a few other key roles. So yeah, if you are interested in looking into that more, our reporter kind of does a full breakdown of a lot of the different aspects that that oversight commission will do, but that's kind of the bare bones of what what we'd be looking at if this measure passes. Great. And now moving on to the dueling affordable housing coming from the mayor or the board of supervisors. Yes. Yeah. So I think this is a topic that we've been hearing a lot about. At least I've been seeing a lot because once again, yeah, homelessness, affordable housing, all of these issues are really up front and center in voters' minds, I think. These two are coming at a pretty critical time for San Francisco. Three months ago, the California Department of Housing and Community Development launched an investigation into San Francisco's housing policies to sort of figure out why the permitting process takes so long here, especially considering we have a massive affordable housing shortage. And so these two measures are both focused on streamlining that process and sort of who gets no power and within the city looking at the permitting process for various affordable housing projects. There are a few key differences. So 
I'm going to sort of outline some of those two. But as George said, it really makes sense to kind of talk about the two of them together because they're both targeting the same thing, but have sort of different ways of going about it. So starting with Proposition D, this was brought forward by Mayor London Breed, and she tried to get it passed by the Board of Supervisors, but ultimately was not successful in that. So she turned with a group of other groups like Habitat for Humanity, Greater SF, SF Yimby, which we know stands for Yes in My Backyard, and a few other groups to get the 10%, I believe, required uh, 10% of registered voters' signatures to have this appear on the ballot. And basically what her plan will do is it will streamline approval for three types of affordable housing development, and that is 100% affordable housing development, affordable housing that's for teachers, and then a third category, which is mixed income buildings. And this is where you kind of start to see some of the differences in the two proposals. So for Mayor London Breed, um, And the plan that she's backing, the ones that would qualify are mixed use buildings with 15% more affordable housing than currently mandated by the city. So the city currently mandates that 22% of a mixed income building is affordable. And so this plan being pushed by Mayor London Breed, Proposition D would require an extra 15% on top of the 22% mandated by the city. In contrast, the other plan, Proposition E, which was pushed by several members of the Board of Supervisors, has a flat requirement of 30% for mixed income housing developments to be streamlined through this approval process. So that's one key difference between the two. Another important aspect that the backers of Proposition D are pushing is that going through the approval process, there are certain housing developments are subject to review under the California Environmental Quality Act. However, Proposition E does not make a complete exemption. So there are some projects under Proposition E that may be subject to review under the California Environmental Quality Act. And so that is another key difference between the two. And people who are in favor of eliminating CEQA oversight say that's really important to making sure that none of these projects are vetoed. And so the opponents of Proposition E are saying, you know, by not including that exemption, uh, that's going to affect how how many sites get built. So yeah, that's another key difference. And then there are other a few smaller differences in things like the labor standards that are required for certain projects. So for Proposition E, there are higher standards that require skilled and trained laborers. There are also differences in area median income requirements and both sides are very passionate about which one is more effective or which one, yeah, will result in higher affordability and less gentrification and all of these other factors. So any other thoughts on either of these, Michelle or or Madison? One thing I thought was interesting is that both of these props could pass because they just require a simple majority to pass. And so then I don't know what would happen. It's not really clarified. You know, would there be lawsuits? Would there... Thank you for bringing that up, Michelle, because I actually meant to mention that. As Michelle pointed out, both of these, it's entirely possible that both of these could pass. And in the event that both pass, whichever receives more votes will go into effect. So even if both get more than 50% of the votes, whichever one receives higher votes, that will knock the other out and the other bill will be null. So yeah, thank you. That That's a very important point to bring up. All right. So moving on to Student Success Fund, Proposition G. Yes. So Prop G was spearheaded by Supervisor Hillary Ronan, and it is a charter amendment that would establish a Student Success Fund And that fund would be operated by the Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families for 15 years. And basically the idea with this fund is that it would provide grants to San Francisco Unified School District schools. And those grants would be paid for using excess property tax revenues. So the grants are up to $1 million annually to SFUSD schools, ranging from pre-K all the way through 12th grade. And the goal of the grants is to improve academic achievement and social and emotional 
wellness for students. And so in its first year, the fund would receive $11 million. Its second year, it would receive $35 million. And up to in, in the fourth year, I believe it's $60 million. So the city controller's analysis said there would be an impact on the cost of government because Proposition G is reallocating funds that would otherwise be available in the general fund. And that is a point that opponents bring up that other city services funded by the general fund, like public transit and police, would potentially be losing out on funds that will be redirected towards schools. The measure also outlines a community school framework that basically creates a model for students, educators, families, and community partners to work with the school administrators to design these programs to help students who are struggling. And the grants that are awarded the funding at schools could go to hiring more educators, nurses, tutors, math specialists, social workers, and all kinds of other support staffs. And it could also be used to fund after school programs or arts and culture programs. And then there are certain requirements that the measure sets up in order to receive the grants, like having a community coordinator who can work with the principal to implement new programs, or having a school site council that endorses the grant proposal for schools that might not have these the ability to easily create the required you know school site council or having that full-time school coordinator there are technical assistance grants that are available to help schools that want to apply for these grants that you know might not have as many resources so yeah that's an overview of Prop G. All right. Then moving on to two of our next propositions, which are joined. And what I find fascinating is these are two propositions that were really kind of born out of the last two and a half years of the pandemic. There are issues that have percolated up because of people being locked down, people wanting to be outside, et cetera. So Madison, share with us, and we're going to kind of link these, right? Because they are linked Proposition I and Proposition J. Yes, they definitely, the fate of these two are also linked, much like D and E. If both of these pass, whichever one receives more votes is going to go into effect. As George referenced during the pandemic, in order to create a more space for social distancing and for people to spend time outside, there were certain stretches of the Great Highway and Golden Gate Park that were closed down to cars for pedestrians and bikers and people to enjoy those spaces. And in May 2022, JFK Drive, the Board of Supervisors voted to turn JFK Drive in Golden Gate Park into what is called the JFK promenade and closed the Great Highway on weekends. And so what proposition I would do is it would overturn that Board of Supervisor vote that closed JFK Drive and the Great Highway, and it would reopen those roads. So what would happen is for JFK Drive, that would remain completely open on weekdays, but closed to private cars on weekends from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., in the months between April and September and on holidays. So outside of those months, the roads would remain open to cars. And then the Great Highway would be open to vehicle traffic seven days a week, except for special approved events by the city. And then the other big part of Proposition I is that it would forbid the city from moving forward with a plan that would eventually close the Great Highway between Slope Boulevard and Skyline Boulevard. Basically, right now, traffic, the plan is to divert traffic to the other side of the San Francisco Zoo along Skyline line and slope boulevard and the reason why that plan is in place is because the great highway is subject to a lot of coastal erosion because of sea level rise and city planners think that maintaining that roadway over time is going to become impossible and pretty expensive and so the plan the city's current plan is to turn that part of the great highway into paths and a parking lot and what proposition i would do is reverse course on that plan and basically, yeah, just forbid the city from moving forward with that plan. And it would take JFK Drive and the Great Highway out of the jurisdiction from the Recreation and Parks Department and under the purview of the Department of Public Works, which manages most of the city's roadways. So supporters of Proposition I include some senior and disability groups who 
say that access to the park with reduced roads is a lot harder for a folks who are older or disabled. The group Seniors for Inclusion said that a nearly 1,000 free parking spaces and ADA parking spaces near attractions like the Conservatory of Flowers and the De Young are no longer accessible. Now that those roads are closed on the side, which include several supervisors, they are saying that um, the cost of maintaining the Great Highway is really expensive, and the city controller's office estimated it was going to cost at least $80 million over the next 20 years to maintain that highway and keep it open for roads, and that, you know, that that's really expensive and also that people really enjoy having these open open spaces. So that's I. And sort of in response to I, to protect that decision that was made, several supervisors introduced Introduce Proposition J, which basically does the opposite. It makes the closure of JFK permanent, and it's kind of there in contrast with Proposition I. And so it would add these road closures and changes to the park code with the goal of shifting park access away from car traffic and more towards pedestrian and bicycle use. So if you've gone through Golden Gate Park in the last few weeks, I know I've seen people there with flyers and signs for both yes on J and no on J or yes on I, no on I. The yes on J campaign specifically claims that public use of the park has increased by 35% since the closure of JFK and the Great Highway, and that 70% of people that they surveyed support that closure. It's not clear how that survey data was conducted, but the groups for Yes on J also cite traffic data that say that JFK Drive was among the top 13% of most dangerous streets in San Francisco when it come when it was open to car traffic. And so they say that, you know, it's it's a good thing these streets were dangerous. And in response to criticisms that uh the park will be less accessible. They also said that the city has added 29 new ADA parking spaces behind the music band shell, which exceeds the number of spaces that were eliminated when the drive was turned into like this promenade area. And there's a later measure that we're going to talk about that also relates to kind of parking in that area. But yeah, for now, that's that's I and J. And Michelle, any insights on I and J? I guess I would just point out there is a new parking shuttle that runs every 15 minutes along JFK Promenade, connecting all the major park attractions to Muni. And so that is an option for people who are not as mobile as as some. Yeah. So that was another argument in support of the of Prop J. <laughs> right. And so moving on to Proposition which is sales tax for transportation. Yes. And actually, that was a great transition from Michelle talking about Muni because L focuses on public transit. And basically, Proposition L is a proposed extension of the city's current 0.5% sales tax that would basically extend a sales tax to fund public transportation through 2053. Right now, San Francisco, actually, the current 0.5% sales tax isn't set to expire for at least another 10 years. But right now, the supporters of Proposition L are wanting to pass this now that would basically extend, replace the existing tax and extend it another 30 years. So this would allow the city to issue up to $1.9 billion in bonds that would be repaid with proceeds from the tax. And the city controller estimated that the tax would generate about $100 million per year in its early years. And by the time the tax is set to expire, it would that number would increase to about $236 million. And the idea is that the revenue from the tax would go to the 2022 Transportation Expenditure Plan, which includes a variety of programs focused on basic transit maintenance, major transit improvements, increasing paratransit services, congestion reduction, pedestrian and bike safety, and some community-based equity planning. So this is, there are a lot of a lot more detailed plans and changes and extensions and and things like that. But basically, the supporters say that passing this proposition now is going to be a really important part of luring back riders. We know that during the pandemic, public transit 
the amount of people using public transit dropped pretty significantly. And that obviously has affected the budgets of a lot of these transit organizations. Back in one of our earlier elections this year, there was a $400 million muni bond measure that failed back in June. And so supporters also say that this is really important to kind of help bolster these services that people use every day. And advocates say that passing the tax now will unlock the potential to qualify for matching federal and state funds. And they basically say that under our current transit plans, we've finished all except for one of the major capital projects. And so the idea is, well, if we pass this now, we can then start implementing all these new projects beginning in 2020. This tax has been, San Francisco has had this 0.5% sales tax going towards public transit since it was first approved in 1989 and voters again elected to extend it in 20, 2003. So this has been around for a long time. Um, but are saying that, that we already have a tax in place that's not going to expire for another 10 years. Why do we need to fund this now? And they also think that the amount of federal funding that's available is false marketing because it doesn't adjust for inflation. And some of these opponents are pushing to retool public transit for a system that takes into account reduced commutes in the work from home setting that we're kind of in now. So yeah, I, I think that's most of the key. Oh, Proposition L is the only measure, all of the other measures on the ballot require 50% plus one votes to pass and Proposition L will require two thirds majority to pass. So that's a key difference here. Great. And then moving back into housing, one of our you know favorite topics here in San Francisco. And besides taxing millionaires, now we're going to take away, we're going to tax people who are not living in their unit. Yes. So Proposition M is basically a tax on vacant properties that is to encourage owners to put those vacant homes back on the market. So it is varied based upon the size of the property as well as how long it has been off the market. And so it would take effect January 1st, 2024, and it ranges on the low end from $2,500 up to $5,000 based on size for that first year. And each year that the your unit remains vacant, it would the cost of that tax would double. This was introduced by Supervisor Dean Preston. And what the goal of the tax, he has said, is really to help encourage people to put money back on, to put units back on the market. But it would also create a fund for helping support other affordable housing issues and seniors who are struggling with high costs of living and things like that. And so that's kind of the idea of the tax. The tax is opposed by groups like the California Apartment Association. And a key exemption in the tax is that it does not apply to one and two unit homes. And so that has kind of caused a stir among certain groups who say, you know, why are we exempting certain homes from this? These we should be also taxing, you know, what's the difference between a two unit home versus a four unit home? And why are we going to be taxing these homes differently? So that's kind of one area that sort of people point to is inconsistencies there. Um, the original measure was based on a tax in Vancouver in Canada. And so, yeah, I, I believe there they, they can look at things like your utility bill. And it's also done sort of through self-reporting of whether or not a home is vacant. And so it would be kind of similar here. I think the authors were saying they would fine tune that process for verifying things a little more if the measure passes the yeah and that i think some opponents have raised issues around privacy just that you know they don't want people looking into their utilities or you know trying to figure out if they're residing in their unit or not but that's the main focus of proposition m michelle any thoughts on proposition m well, I was reading recently that the city controller has come out and said that this might actually only apply to 4,000 units in the mm -hmm. city and maybe would estimate, they estimate that it might only free up about 250 units that would then be rented. So there are, 
they're arguing, you know, maybe this needs to be reworked and appear on the ballot again in the future. <laughs> And I think also to put into context, the Budget and Legislative Analyst Office in a report in January 2022 said that as of 2019, San Francisco had over 40,000 vacant units, which is almost 10% of the city's housing stock. So it was those high numbers that kind of pushed supporters to say, you know, if 10% of our housing stock is vacant and we have so many issues around homelessness and lack of affordable housing and things like that, why not tax, put a tax on those vacant homes? So that was kind of the onus behind creating this measure in the first place. All right. So moving on to our last one, which is Proposition O and supporting one of Eric and my favorite topics, that City College of San Francisco, mm -hmm. which is where we first launched Voices of the Community way back when. So yes, Proposition O is a proposed parcel tax to generate funding for a variety of programs and services at City College. And the tax would begin in 2023 and continue all the way through 2043. So it's a 20-year tax and the city controller estimates that it's going to generate about $37 million annually, but that number will increase over time as the tax is adjusted for inflation. So the idea with the tax is that the revenue is going to be split four ways once you take out administrative costs. And so a quarter of the fund should go towards services that support basic student needs like enrollment, job retention, things like that. Um, Another 25% would go more towards skill-focused programs like English language tutoring or technological proficiency for people wanting to work on those kinds of skills. Another quarter would go towards workforce development programs, and the last quarter would go towards equity programs and social justice programs that support the development of students who are historically underrepresented in the college. So... That is kind of the idea of the basic fund breakdown. The tax has a note that only a less than 1% of funds from the tax should go towards administering the tax. However, the city controller does estimate that it's going to cost a lot more. I want to say it, it'll be a $6 million startup cost because of the way that the tax is structured. It's going to cost about $6 million in startup costs and then an additional, I believe, $3 million every year after that to administer the tax because of the way that it's structured. And so that's something that opponents cite when they're talking about why they don't support the tax. The parcel tax is based on the size of the parcel or the building on the parcel. And there are exemptions for folks who are over the age of 65 who own and reside in their properties, as well as certain nonprofits who are already exempt from property taxes. And a little bit of context for part of the reason why supporters are pushing for this tax is that City College has seen a lot of cuts in recent years, in part due to declining enrollment that started back with the accreditation crisis and got worse during the pandemic. The enrollment has dropped in the last decade by tens of thousands of students. So that has meant less funding for the college and as well as several financial crises and issues around that in the last few few years that have led to a faculty layoffs and a reduction in the number of courses that are available. And so proponents are in support of this tax as a way to keep offering these really key resources to all San Franciscans who are able to take classes at City College for free through programs at City College. And supporters say it's really important to make sure that no San Franciscans are left behind and that City College is a really key place for folks to start on a better path in life to make more money and support themselves more. So yeah, that's an overview of, of that parcel tax. And are there opponents to supporting City College? Yes. Yeah, so opponents uh, have talked about basically, uh, and I actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there actually already is a parcel tax on City College, a flat parcel tax. I believe it's $95 a year, I want to say, for parcels in the city. And so they're saying we're already supporting 
City College through the existing parcel tax, and they've also cited financial mismanagement of City College at the last few years saying it doesn't make sense to write a blank check when we don't know how successful City College administrators will be in actually implementing these programs. And part of the measure, if it passes, will require that City College submit an annual spending plan to the mayor and the Board of Supervisors in order to receive the revenue from the tax, as well as audits for the first five years of the tax every year, and then periodic audits after that. And the bill also creates an oversight committee that makes sure that the investments are used properly. So that's kind of been the rebuttal from supporters. But yes, there are opponents, including the San Francisco Apartment Association and the San Francisco Taxpayers Association. And interestingly, also Mayor London Breed and two supervisors, Supervisor Aaron Peskin and Supervisor Catherine Stefani also have said that taxpayers should, quote, hold City College accountable by not passing another bond, given the the high turnover in chancellors that City College has had in the last few years and the $1.3 billion in public bonds that have, voters have already approved in the last 20 years to fund City College. Okay. And Michelle, let's start with you. Where can folks go to get all of this great information? Thank you. Thanks for giving us this opportunity to talk about the ballot props. And I would direct people for more information on the San Francisco props to our website, which is lwvsf.org. And we have a pro-con guide there. We also do advocate for some of the local props, not all. And then also, I would really recommend this website called Voters Edge that the National League of Women Voters puts it out. And there's one for every state. And you just type in your zip code or your address, and it just gives you so much information about all of the candidates and the ballot props. It's really useful. And you can do a little false ballot there to help yourself get organized at the end to actually fill out your real ballot. (laughs) That's great. And then Madison, where can listeners go and and viewers go to access your voter guide? Yeah. So if folks head over to sfpublicpress.org on our homepage, the first thing at the top of the banner is our nonpartisan voter guide for this year's election. We have written in audio versions of in-depth analyses of every San Francisco measure that's on the ballot, in addition to how many votes it needs to pass. And we also are including biographies of each candidate who is running for local office and those who are hoping to represent San Francisco at the state level in the state assembly and several regional positions like BART, a regional director and the District 2 Board of Equalization. So in our guide, we also have links to candidates' websites and social media, and we have audio recordings of candidates' answers to questions we wrote after combing through a community survey we did. So We have a lot of resources there, both for the propositions and for other local elections happening here in San Francisco. Right. We want to thank both Michelle and Madison for sharing their wonderful insights in both the state of California and the city of San Francisco propositions. We'll make sure that listeners and viewers have your contact information, website, social media, along with the links to your voter guides and all the resources for the 2022 state and local elections. And please stay safe and healthy as we all work our way through its our latest stage of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of its variants. Today's episode was made possible by the audio wizard and our associate producer, Eric Estrada, and the graphics magic of Casey Nance from Citron Studios, along with the wonderful crew at the San Francisco Public Press and KSFP, along with the folks at Bayback and SF Commons. Voices of the Community is supported by a grant from the James Irvine Foundation, dedicated to a California where all low-income workers have the power to advance economically. More at irvine.org. Please go to my website, georgecoster.com and click on Voices of the Community to find links to the extended versions of these interviews. Voices of the Community is a member of Intersection for the Arts, which allows us to offer you a tax deduction for your contributions. Please go to georgecoster.com and click on the donate link to make a donation to help us provide future shows 
just like this one. While you're on our website, you can enjoy our archived past shows, which feature community voices working on solutions to critical issues facing Northern California communities. And you can sign up for our newsletter to find out more about future shows, as well as shows and events from the organizations that are included in our episodes. Take us along on your next COVID walk by subscribing to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at George Coster, and we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas, so send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster in San Francisco, and thank you for listening.